Okay, so this talk is going to be about the Riemann series rearrangement theorem. Some people just call the Riemann series theorem, and it's about certain kinds of series. So series is something like this: you have summation k equals one to infinity a sub k. This is a infinite sum. How is this sum defined? Hmm? The sum is defined as the sum of all the terms. Yeah, but it's defined as a limit of something, right? Limit of what? I'm not sure. Well, it's defined as so. If you want to add up infinitely many terms, you cannot add them up all at once, right? So you add up the first. So let's write this down. So you have a series a one plus a two plus a three plus is the nth term. Okay, how would you add this up? How do you find this infinite sum? What would you compute? Hmm. Well, you'd say first we do a1, then you add a1 plus a2, then you do a1 plus a2 plus a3, right? And then you take the limit of these things, okay? So what is it? It's a limit of as n goes to infinity of what? The sum of we take k from 1 to n. Yes, exactly. That's what I said. Okay, and these sums are called the these things whose limit you are taking are called the what? Well, they are called the partial sums. Okay. Okay. So, simply, it matters like what order you write them in, right? Like this this series actually you are taking a one, then a one plus a two, then a one plus a two plus a three, and so on. So, and that's we'll see why that's significant. Okay, but this is that formal definition. If this limit exists, then that's the series sum. If the limit doesn't exist, the series doesn't. Uh, this cannot be sum. Uh, by the way, if you just have a series and I say the sum exists, then you say that the series converges. Okay, that's terminology uh, which you're hopefully familiar with. Uh, now, the series is called conditionally convergent if it converges, but Another series, which is just the absolute values of the terms, does not converge. Okay. So if the absolute value series converged, it would be called absolutely convergent. So conditionally convergent means convergent, but not absolutely convergent. Okay. Okay. Now uh, I'll. Let me just write down an example. I won't explain fully why that's not because that may be a little difficult for some people to understand. But here's here's one example of a series that's conditionally convergent, but not absolutely. I mean, so it's it's convergent but not absolutely convergent. Therefore, it's conditionally convergent. So this series is convergent by a result called the alternating series theorem. Which we have a separate video on, but basically the terms are going to zero, decreasing in magnitude and alternating in sign. And if that happens, the series converges. Okay, it is not absolutely convergent. Why? Well, what are the absolute values of the terms? What's the series of absolute values of the terms? Draw negative signs to positive. Okay, this series does not converge. Okay. Uh, you can see it many ways. You can see it using the integral test. The corresponding integral doesn't converge. You can, if you are already familiar with the degree differences, which basically again follows from the integral test. This this is like summation of this rational function, and this rational function summation one over k. Uh, if the degree difference is one, and if the degree difference is one, the rational function summation doesn't converge. Okay, so you do have examples of series that are convergent but not uh, absolutely convergent. So, th so this definition does get satisfied at least for some things. Uh, can you tell me what this converges to? I mean we don't, the information I've given you doesn't tell you. Do you happen to know what this converges to? No. Uh, well it converges to law, natural log of 2. Uh, that's not obvious at all. It follows from some stuff with power series which you might see at a later stage. Uh, but but that's that's not it's not important what it converges to. The point is it's conditionally converges. Okay, so so here's the theorem. So actually, it's part four is the real theorem. Part one, two, three you can think of as preliminary things for the theorem. 
So part one says that the terms have to go to zero. Now that actually just follows from it converging. If a series converges, the terms have to go to zero. Do you see why? Well, if the sum is some some uh, finite real number, right? If the series. And the uh, and the sum of the series is L, then the partial sum. So remember, L is the limit of what? Limit as n approaches infinity of what? Partial sum. Yeah. K equals one to n. Okay, that's good. Now where? Now now suppose the limit is L, which means that eventually all the partial sums will be trapped in a small neighborhood of L, right? So if this neighborhood is of radius epsilon, then all the partial sums are within here. So how big can the terms be? What's the maximum size any term can have? If, like eventually all the terms will have size at most, what? Epsilon. Not epsilon. It could go from here to here and from here to here. Zero. Well, zero when you take epsilon approaching zero but right now if if all the partial sums are here are in this ball mm -hmm. then what can you say the difference between any two things in this ball is at most what two epsilon two epsilon and and a, a, any term is the difference between one partial sum and the next right so a1 plus a2 to an minus 1 and the next partial sum is a1 plus a2 plus an minus 1 plus an you've added an right so if this partial sum is in the ball in this interval and this partial sum is also in this interval then that means the difference a n has to have size at most or less than 2 epsilon, two epsilon right and so eventually all the terms become at most 2 epsilon and therefore as epsilon goes to 0 the terms have to go to 0 so that's a rough idea and that that doesn't require condition terms. that's just a fact about convergent series okay now the, the next two things are interesting. It says that if you just look at the positive terms, then that subseries diverges. And if you just look at the negative terms, then that subseries diverges, which means the positive terms add up to infinity and the negative terms add up to what? Negative, negative infinity. Uh, why should that be true? Well, this is where Suppose the positive terms are actually added up to some number, like so here's your series, a1 plus a2, and let's say the sum is 4, okay? And suppose the positive terms add to 13, okay? Now, if the positive terms added up to something finite, the negative terms would also have to add up to something finite. What should the negative terms add up to? Nine. The nine negative. Nine. Okay. Now, what should the absolute values add up to then? Yeah. Now, the absolute value series, what will that add up to? 21, 22. Why did you say 21 first? No idea. Oh, okay. Okay, so 22, right? So what, what I'm basically saying is if the positive terms converge and the negative terms are also forced to converge and then the sum, uh, the sum of the absolute things of these will be the absolute value and that will converge and that contradicts our assumption it's not absolutely convergent, right? Similarly, the negative terms converge, the positive would also have to converge and then the absolute values would also have to converge. So therefore, neither the positive nor the negative things can converge. So the positive ones have to diverge and the negative ones have to diverge. Okay, that's not a full formal proof. This is just the idea. You would have to prove various things to establish it formally. Okay, so here so far, the terms go to zero. The positive term subseries diverges. The negative term subseries diverges. Okay. Hmm? Okay. Now we come to the really remarkable fact, which is this. Suppose I pick two numbers. Well, they need not be numbers. They are allowed to be minus infinity and infinity. So what does this notation mean? It's like all reals, but I'm including minus infinity and infinity. Okay. Okay. So suppose I take two things in here. Okay. And this one's less than equal to the other. And you know how you compare minus infinity with ordinary numbers and with each other, with infinity, right? So you have two things and they could be equal, but L is less than equal to. So L is lower and U is upper. Then 
uh, there is a rearrangement of the AKs. So you can rearrange, you can permute the AKs such that with this rearranged series, the partial sums have lim inf equal L and lim sup equal C. So you're wondering what lim inf and lim sup are, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, uh, so here's your series, right? Summation. Let's call it BK now. Okay. Now lim and the, so pa the partial sum. Let's define S sub n is summation k equals one to n of bk. Now we are interested in the, so the ordinarily when you just take what's the infinite sum, you'll just take limit n approaches infinity s n. This is the sum of the series, right? Now, now I could also define this thing, lim inf as n approaches infinity s n. What this is doing is, for every n, what this really is, is, is limit as n approaches infinity, inf of m greater than or equal to n of s sub n. So, for every n, it's looking at the GLB of uh, sums. GLB of all the partial sums beyond that. Okay? And then it's making n approach infinity. So what that essentially is doing is, imagine this type of situation. So you're here. The partial, how do you do your partial sum? Say first you start with zero, you add a1, right? Then you add a2. Then you add a3, which may be negative. Some of them could be negative, some of them could be positive. Then you add a4, and so on. So you're keeping on hopping along the number line, right? And these points are the partial sums, right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the lim inf of these is sort of saying, suppose these partial sums didn't converge. So suppose you had a situation where, you know, they're, they're sort of going like, they're keeping on oscillating between two numbers like that. Then you want to say the lim inf is the smaller number and the lim sup, which I'll define later, is the bigger one. But the point is the lim inf, it's sort of saying it's the smallest num thing which keeps occurring or near which you keep going. Okay. So it's, it's, it's like you're taking the limb, you're taking among the, among the things which you keep sort of going near, it's the smallest one. It's the leftmost one among the th uh, things you, you keep on going near. So, uh, so. I mean, formally, it's just this. It's a limit as n approaches infinity. Inf just means the, uh, the sort of, inf just is just shorthand for the GLB, if you want. Okay, so it's the limit as n approaches infinity of the GLB of uh, all the partial sums beyond n. And so you're, you're taking the, the smallest thing which keeps occurring in, up, up to infinity. And similarly, you can have the limb soup. So define similarly, it should be the limit as n approaches infinity supremum of m greater than or equal to n of s. Okay. Uh, so intuitively, if your summation is sort of you have these two points and your summation is sort of your partial sums, they are they are sort of oscillating between clustering here and clustering along around this one. Then here you have your limit and here you have your limb soup. Okay, if your partial sums are just sort of converging to a single point, then that's that's the limit, and that's then equal to both the lim inf and lim sup. But you could have situations where the lim inf and lim sup are not the same. Okay, so uh, so great. So we want to now show this thing, which says that any pair of numbers you can arrange the series in such a way such that the lim inf is the lower one and the lim sup is the bigger one. So what the remarkable thing it's saying is that you know, here you have your series, say this series, and we have told you the sum is ln2. What, what I'm saying is that uh, give me some other real number. Hmm? 
give me some other real number. One fourth. One fourth. There is a way of rearranging the series. Oh, give me two real numbers actually. One so is one. I have one and four. One and four. Okay. So there's a way of rearranging the series such that the limb inf of the partial sums is one, and the limb sup of the partial sums is four. Okay. Uh, you could also pick one of the things to be infinity and one to be negative infinity. So you could uh, you could uh, show that there's a way of rearranging the series such that the limb inf of the partial sums is uh, is 5 and the limb soup of the partial sums is infinity. Okay. So how would you do this? How would you prove this? Okay, let's maybe we'll do we can do that in a separate video, right? The actually the construction. Okay. Mm -hmm. 